Okay, here's a wrap up video for the lab. Um, so if you uh, place the mass or whatever right on the spring and let it sort of stretch until it stops, right? Then we'll see here, I should have like some kind of tension force or whatever from the spring up and then I'll have whatever the force of gravity is down, okay? And then those two are gonna be equal uh, because no motion, right? So since this um, block isn't moving at the time that we're gonna look at when it stopped, we know that those two forces are going to be equal, okay? Uh, we'll do some more difficult stuff later when it moves, but for now, it's just gonna be still, all right? Um, okay, so when you make the graph, despite the fact that I messed it up and this should have said x-axis, okay, you should have had some kind of graph like this. So this should be like x in meters, okay, and force of tension in newtons, right? But what we're really going to do, oops, is measure the fg because that's the thing that we can measure. And then we just know that that's equal to the tension, okay? All right, so you should have had, you know, two lines, whatever your springs were, should have maybe looked something like this, Okay. All right. The relation shown in the graph, hopefully it goes through zero, zero, which makes it direct. Okay. Sometimes they have uh, what's called like a loading force on the spring, you know, so there might be some amount um, here, right? Like you would have to apply a little bit of force just to kind of get the coils, like, I don't know, to open sort of, right? Like, um, so that might be like a loading, they call it like a loading force, but we don't usually have to deal with that. Okay. Um, so well, anyway, we'll skip that. Okay, so I would say as the, I'm going to say it opposite because it makes more sense even though we graph it this way. As the force, well, no, I won't. As the spring stretch increases, okay, the force of the spring increases. Okay, proportionally, right, because it's direct. You can only say proportionally if it's direct, okay? Proportionally, all right? Um, and then if you chose an unknown mass, right, you should have hopefully just been able to pick some unknown mass, right? And then if you follow it across and put it here, even if you didn't measure it, you would know how far it would stretch it, right? So once you kind of have this line, you could put any, you could know how far any mass would end up stretching the spring, right? So you should, you know, label that right there, okay? All right, so uh, the mathematical model shown in the graph, right? So remember, I'm starting kind of with this y equals mx plus b. Okay, so that would be force. And I'm going to call this force of the spring now instead of tension uh, more generally because this is actually a spring and it's going to get its own equation. Okay, and then you're going to get some... I don't want to use 10. Let's use 8. You're going to get some constant, okay, your slope, 8 newtons per meter, times the spring stretch we usually call delta x. Okay, and then hopefully it's plus zero, right? Hopefully there's not another force, okay? I mean a y-intercept. Okay, and then you may have like another one, your other line. Okay, so you have your two different lines. Check these units, right? It should be newtons per meter, okay? Um, and the slope of this, right, these are telling you for every uh, one meter of stretch takes eight newtons of force or provides eight newtons of force. Okay, every one meter of stretch takes eight newtons of force. For the second spring, you can stretch it a meter with just four newtons of force. All right. Um, so this is going to be kind of a different, a difference in the spring itself. Okay. So this value is what we call the spring constant. Sometimes they call it the force constant, which I don't really like. Um, the spring constant, it basically tells you how strong or like how stretchy the spring is. Okay, so a big number, right? If it takes a lot of force to stretch it a meter, that would be a very strong spring. If it takes um, not that much force to stress it, that would be a really weak spring, like a slinky, okay? So the higher that spring constant number is, the, the stiffer or, or harder the spring is to stretch or compress, okay? All right, you write your second sentence. Okay, uh, so this graph models Hooke's law. Okay, so if I have this Fs equals, let's say, 8 newtons per meter x, okay, instead of this spring constant, this is a symbol k, right? So this spring constant up here has a symbol of lowercase k. Okay, make sure it's lowercase because uppercase, you know, is kinetic energy, okay? So this um, equation here is called Hooke's law. So this guy, I think it was Robert Hooke. Uh, I don't know, came up with this about the springs, 
I mean, come on, it doesn't look that hard. Okay, uh, so this is called Hooke's Law. All right, so uh, from now on, if you know how far the spring is stretched, okay, so if I know how far the spring is stretched, and then I know how strong the spring is, right, I'll be able to find the force that's provided by the string, the spring, the spring, all right? So by knowing how strong it is and how much I stretch it, I'll now know how much force that spring is able to provide, okay? All right, um, if you look on the AP equation sheet, you're gonna see Hooke's Law written like this with this negative sign, okay? Uh, in practice, you won't put the negative sign in the problems because you're gonna sort of pre-assign the direction, right? Um, but this negative sign here is telling you that the displacement, they're noting it as a vector, and the spring force noted as a vector are in opposite directions, okay? Right, so like if I have a, a spring, right, and let's say the displacement of the spring is this way, like I crunch it down like this, then it's going to want to pop back the force this way, okay? Right, same thing if I stretch it out, it wants to pop back the other way. The force is opposite from the way that you stretch or compress it, okay? So that's why there's a negative sign, okay? But in practice, you won't really put the negative sign in the equation because it's just complicated, Okay, all right, um, anything that's stretchy like this or a spring that follows this, we call a Hookean spring, okay? And something that doesn't follow it, we would call non-Hookean, right? So if you graphed, right, your F versus X and it kind of like went mm, or something, right? This would be a non-Hookean spring, okay? If you make a graph and it comes out linear like this, this would be a Hookean spring because it continues to follow Hooke's law, okay? And a lot of springs in practice are hooky in for a while, right? Like they follow Hooke's law for a little bit and then they kind of start to break down and then they kind of don't follow it anymore, all right? Um, all right, okay, so that's kind of the basics of it. So in practice, it would look something like this. Uh, the spring has a constant of 20 newtons per meter, so that's my K, okay? And then there's my mu. Um, if I push this box to the right and then release it, what would it look like if uh, the spring is stretched, but the box is stationary, okay? So my box here, right, I'd have my FG and my FN on the box, which would be equal, right, because up and down the box isn't accelerating or even moving, okay? The spring, right, if I stretch this spring out, right, my delta X, I know the force is going to be opposite because of that negative sign, okay? So I'm going to say I have a spring force trying to pull the box to the left, but if it doesn't, oops, but if it doesn't move, that means there has to be a friction to the right. That would be what would be balancing that out, okay, right? Um, so eventually, right, you could pull it too far that the friction, right, since it's static friction, it gives all it can give, <clears throat> okay? But assuming that it's not maxing out, okay, or getting it to the max point, how far could you pull it, right, before it actually starts to move, okay? Which is the next question. All right, so if I'm going to sum my forces in the x direction or zero, just like usual, okay, my spring force equals the friction. Okay, now I know spring force is kx. Remember, no negative because I've already taken that into account by making this arrow here go to the left, okay? kx equals mu fn, all right, and this is mu static, and I can use this equation because um, we're talking about the maximum static friction, right? So this only works, remember, for static, you can only use the equation if you're at the max, all right? Uh, what's the maximum distance it can be stretched? So that would be mg over k. So I don't know, whatever this is, 1 times 10 over 20. Can I do this in my head? Is that even possible? 1 half of 0.4? Oh, sure. Look at that. I'm so smart. Okay, so 0 0.02 meters is as far as you could stretch that. If you stretch it further than that, right, then it's going to start bouncing back because the friction doesn't have enough to give. Okay. All right. And then thinking about a pie chart analysis of it, we'll, we'll do more of this. There's a whole unit on simple harmonic motion, okay, on springs and stuff. But just for now, um, thinking about the energy, right? So when the spring is at zero, right, we call that like its equilibrium point. Okay. And that would be when it's not stretched or compressed. Okay. So the box would start at that point with no energy. Okay, so in order to give it energy, you're going to have to put work into the system or do work on the system and actually physically pull this block to the right. Okay, so once you do that, you could put it over here, okay, and it would have only spring energy at the start. 
okay? And then slowly that block is going to start to accelerate this way, right, as the spring pulls it back, all right? And then it's going to get faster, right? In, uh, well, I'll just do it here. Okay, so here, oops, not you, Gene. Okay, so here, right, it might have some kind of spring and some kind of kinetic, okay? And by the time it reaches the equilibrium point, it would have only kinetic, right? Because at equilibrium, the spring would not be stretched or compressed. It's kind of in that middle thing. It's sort of like when the velocity goes through zero, when something turns around and changes direction, kind of like that, okay? Because the force is going to change direction, right? Because I've gone from stretch to compress. Okay, so now it's going to compress and it's going to start storing energy, right? Until it gets sort of to its maximum on the other side. Okay, right? So it's going to kind of like oscillate back and forth, all right? Once it gets to here, I'm going to, it's going to be compressed as far as it can, right? Now it's going to end up starting to push back the other way, right? So this is just going to kind of oscillate back and forth, okay? If no friction, in theory, forever, right? Okay. So it's going to kind of go through this pattern as it oscillates back and forth, all right? Um, now, if there's friction, which we know there is, as soon as this starts sliding along the ground, part of this pi is going to start getting taken up, right, by that energy that's being wasted from friction, right, until eventually, you know, maybe here, right, and then it goes back and it wastes more, and then it wastes more, and then it wastes more, right, until eventually that whole pi is going to get taken over by that thermal energy, right? The energy is just going to keep wasting out as that uh, spring sort of damps out, okay? Um, but we'll do a lot more with that later. Okay, that was it for that page.